Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome back to Elf Bait. It is Sunday, which means it's stream time. And uh, today I'm going to talk about Gonzo into your gaming. Um, and it looks like we're still waiting for folks to show up. Got about two in chat. Uh, go ahead and say hello if you're here. Um, suppose you know, brief little chat about like what I've been doing game wise. Uh, I haven't been getting a lot of gaming in. Uh, life has been happening, so it's been uh, keeping me from playing in games and then um, uh, running my game. Also, uh, we had, you know, my wife had a virus uh, recently, and so that kind of knocked out my game. Uh, and then I was not feeling well for the last game, or I had company. Can't remember when it lined up exactly, but it seems to be something there's always something <clears throat> uh to that end uh i am going to be starting some games on monday um i'm working on getting stuff set up for those before i announce specific times um but i'd like to do maybe a campaign and a series of one shots or maybe just a series of one shots um and uh Monday is an odd slot, I know, but I can't be the only one who's got Mondays off uh, or a time available on Monday. Uh, one of the games will be later in the evening on Mondays. Um, I don't have to work Tuesdays, so I can play late. I know not everybody is so lucky, but it's a chance for me to get some extra gaming in. Uh, I do have a Dune game I'm going to be playing in uh, with Cody uh, coming up, uh, Jim Cody. Um, that is proving to be quite a cool ramp up. Just the, just the, the setup on that is really cool. Um, just been having a lot of fun, um, you know, uh, just developing characters in the background. He kind of left it to us. Uh, morning, morning, Logan from the hilt there. Um, but yeah, I uh, so Mondays are pretty much free and clear for me, and I haven't been doing anything, and I'm getting tired of just sitting there all day doing nothing or wasting my day. Um, I mean, there's always stuff I could be doing, but I never do. Um, let's see, on other fronts, um, released uh, a new miniatures uh, release with a friend of mine. We, we worked on this together, and it was a uh, space fleet. Um, that we did together. I had originally built them out of woodcraft beads and stuff like that. And then uh, he has turned them into amazing digital designs that are inspired by and pretty much as direct a translation from those uh, as we could, uh, which is cool. I mean, some there were some limitations as to what I could do in the digitals. So, um, but yeah, you can see them here on the screen. Uh, this is the the fleet that we did. Um, these are kind of ostensibly based on the old, um, some of the counters from the old Imperium game. Um, and th they're kind of these big, just very, I don't know, like they're non-linear ships. I mean, they certainly are linear. They have a front and a back, but you can see they're all kind of very, uh, cylindrical with like simple shapes and forms and the funny and, and the reason for this honestly is so the original counters from the old Imperium game were shaped like this sort of but they're all done in silhouette and so I had started taking beads and pieces of woodcraft um, material and stuff and uh, plastic and everything and, and, and turning these into various ship shapes um, and I had finished quite a few, but it was turning out to be uh, quite a chore to make each one of these from scratch. Um, some of them had some really involved bits uh, that work on them. And so then Andreas, uh, my, my, my buddy um, from back in Washington, he uh, he's quite an accomplished digital artist and is good at doing nice clean designs and came up with these ship designs for for the beadwork that I did or the bead ships that I did. So now my fleet is now a 3D printable uh, STL file. And uh, we had our first sale today, so I'm kind of chuffed on that one. Uh, 
other than that, uh, I picked up a whole bunch of bloody miniatures, uh, English Civil War figures uh, to use for my iteration of the Silver Bayonet. If you're not familiar with the Silver Bayonet, that is a... Um, uh, uh, it's a miniature skirmish game um, for out by Osprey that is set in the Napoleonic era. It's imagine the Napoleonic soldiers and witch hunters and stuff like that fight going after monsters uh, in various parts of Europe. Um, but it, it's sword and musket. So uh, I just dialed it back a bit to where I've always wanted to play sort of a spooky monster fighting game. And that's in early 17th century America. And so English Civil War figures are perfect for that. And Bloody Miniatures is, are, are even better for that because Bloody Miniatures are all skirmish posed. Most English Civil War figures you're going to find are designed for rank and flank armies. And so pike blocks, musket, blo you know, musket uh, regiments, things like that, cavalry. But Bloody Miniatures focuses on um, the rank and uh, the skirmish type characters. Uh, so you've got a lot of like lesser troops, like local farmers and stuff that are, that are carrying guns, looters, um, pistoliers, things like that, uh, dismounted storming parties, things like that, that are great for putting up against werewolves and vampires and, you know, other monsters of the American woods, whatever you want to put out there. So those are great. Um, cool thing is the same sculptor had done some earlier miniature ranges. He sculpted the Bicorn range and the Renegade range. And he has tried to keep these ones in the same style and scale. So if you have miniatures from those older ranges, you can in in integrate them pretty well. Uh, so that's been my my gaming. Um, I'm working on, like I mentioned earlier, writing up some stuff for the Monday games that I want to start uh, real quick. Hey, GM Cody, you're welcome. Good morning. Uh, Mages Musings is here. All right. So on to the topic. Um, Gonzo. What is Gonzo? Um, well, that's kind of an interesting one because Gonzo is, um, really a style. It's not anything specific. It's one of those things where you kind of know it when you see it. There are things that it is not. Gonzo is not, um, you know, just random, random crap that, you know, you just, you know, throw out. Uh, or, I mean, it can be, but it tends to be better when you have some rhyme or reason to it. it, it in other words, it's an exercise in restraint. I know, here's a good gonzo kind of image. You know, you got the bright colors and kind of surrealistic uh, and landscape and subject matter. Um, you know, this is a good example. Um, there are, that is not gonzo, that is cyberpunk. I didn't know where's that. Anyways, my images are all out of whack here. Anyways, the implementation of Gonzo is one of those things that can spoil your game or make your game. Um, because I think, again, there's a misrepresentation that it is just random, crazy bullshit pulled out of your ass. And while some of it can be that, if you don't use it sparingly, you're going to screw up your game. Uh, some games are supposed to be over the top, uncontrollable gonzo. Uh, don't need to put gonzo in your game. Just need to put players in a game and gonzo will fall. Uh, you know, I don't. So I would say that madcap shenanigans would follow, but I don't think it'll necessarily be gonzo. Um, and, Again, that's a word that ends up meaning nothing when you say it too often. But what we're really looking at is sort of a surreal, not quite, not quite realistic, kind of bigger than life sort of a game. Um, a good example of Gonzo would be the original heavy metal movie. Um, huge chunks of that are are Gonzo. You know, uh, the Tarna Tarakian one is Gonzo. The um, the the cabbie segment is Gonzo. There's you know the 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 space guys who you know abduct the the woman. You know that's that's Gonzo. Um, there's uh, 
you know, Wizards is kind of Gonzo. As dark as it is, I mean, Gonzo doesn't have to be lighthearted either. You can have Gonzo and have it be gritty and weird, where like Wizards was kind of dark. Uh, you know, that's a good example. You know, Thundar. Thundar is Gonzo. Um, honestly, Gonzo is a really good way to describe anything with Jack Kirby's fingerprints on it um, because he had that style and that presentation. Um, it's a uh, you know, it's a, uh, it's a way to play where you're really tapping into your, your creative juices and your imagination. You can kind of park your verisimilitude a little bit off to the side. You still want to be able to see it, but you don't have to, you're not going to bank on it. You're not going to, you, you I run really you know, I try to run really believable worlds with a high degree of verisimilitude and that it, um, you know, you kind of have to set that aside if you're going to run a Gonzo world. You have to not, you have to be unafraid of making things that don't make sense. The Dark Crystal is another good one that comes to my mind for a Gonzo universe. Everything is weird and wild and clearly just the expression of madcap imaginations. Morning RPG Dead. Um, but, you know, it's... It's kind of hard to say how to implement it in any specific way. So it's not the greatest topic for a video, um, but it was, it's been on my mind because that's kind of how I want to run my Gamma World game. Because Gamma World is one of the games I want to run on my Mondays. Is I want to play a universe, I want to play a world that is not quite as gritty and solid. And the original Gamma World game, you know, first and second editions were pretty gonzo as well. Um, it, later on, it started to take itself a little more seriously, and that just kind of trends with how things progressed into the 90s and all of that, where just fantastic for fantastic sake it sort of tended to get parked on the side. Uh, Talos Lanta does have a touch of it. Talos Lanta is Gonzo, at least stylistically, and just that everything goes in 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 Talos Lanta. It's, it's it's all over the place as far as what it presents um but you know again too much of of it is going to wreck your setting unless that's what you're going for and then at that, that point you're you're probably playing more of a comedy game or you know you know, an acid trip game whatever you want to do um I guess a good way to express it would be, for example, let's say your your party is going through a field of flowers or a open field, you know, in the setting. And in a normal setting, you might describe how there are beautiful wildflowers and how, you know, the, the, the wind, you know, sweeps through the, the tall grass. Um, to make that gonzo, you might have the flowers opening up and having something interesting or weird happening or have... When every time the grass blows, there's a, a twinkling of, you know, like iridescent, you know, particles that blow off of them or something. And, you know, maybe the clouds are are colorful and and, and kind of move in weird patterns, something like that. Um, Gonzo is best when it has more grounding surrounding it and not just nuts. Exactly. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, it is... If you're doing it madcap, then you, you certainly are... are are going to have fun because you're choosing to do that. So you're, if you're playing that. I hope you're having fun. But if you're wanting to run a Gonzo game that actually has any seriousness to it, you do want to use it in, in moderation. Uh, even if it is maybe the whole theme again, going back to Thundar, uh, Thunder the Barbarian, very deep, dark world with a lot going on, but any idea was on the table. And I think that's really the core of your Gonzo. Um, and it's about taking the normal things that you would have in your, and kind of bring it back to gaming, taking the things that you would normally have in your games and then tweaking them. So instead of say a giant insect attacking your players, it might be a giant clockwork insect or a crystal insect or something like that, or, you know, a giant crystal clockwork insect, you know, whatever, you know, uh, you know, your humanoids, uh, 
instead of being grays and browns, make them purples and reds and have them, you know, carrying strange crystal weapons instead of metal weapons. Um, you know, just really lean into it. Uh, your color, your visual color palette that you, that you're you're using in your mind's eye should probably be a little bit more saturated uh, than than uh, than normal. You know, you definitely want it to be bright and uh, and and colorful. Uh, I I said, Cone, I said Thunder the Barbarian and summoned Mar Hawkman. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, this is actually a, a not a not a bad idea at all. You know, if you have three races of lizard men, make one purple, make one green, and make one blue, and that way, you know, oh, it's the blue lizard men of the north, it's the green lizard men of the dark jungles, and it's the red lizard men of the lava plains. Lean into that, you know. Um, um no. Um, I mean, I, it's your world. Go for it. Uh, Tiefling should not be one color, though. Um, Virgil Lackmore was an example. Yes. So, especially when you consider the original Blackmore, the whole basis of that is spaceship from Earth crashes on world. And Arneson's early magic item list reads like the treasure list from Gamma World. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, um, that is true. They have that. Oh, that they didn't. That that they. I mean, that's expedition to the very peaks. Uh you know, and that is a good example of a Gonzo adventure. Another example of a D and D adventure that's pretty Gonzo is White Plume Mountain. Without introducing space and tech, it still ends up being kind of over the top, but thematically solid. It is a Funhouse adventure, Funhouse dungeon without being stupid or dumb or crazy it kind of makes sense um let's see what else we got here um later logan take care uh so world building in gonzo settings is another one that's uh something you want to think about as well um don't be afraid to mix your your genres when world building um and it can make sense in the setting for example you might have a tech society but have heavy rituals or blend magic into your settings or if your setting has a psionics set of psionics rules treat it in world maybe like magic or maybe magic is treated like psionics or maybe they're all just treated as as nature um you know, robots sometimes come in the form of things that are other than robots. Um, you know, it, it's, you you can definitely build that world, you build your world in the gonzo sense by having it built kind of over the top. Mountains are always a little bit more extreme. Deserts are big and differently colored. Oceans often have characteristics like acid or vinegar or, you know, whatever it is the case. And if you laugh at vinegar seas, read the Monster Blood uh, uh, Tattoo Trilogy. Uh, it's a cool setting. But um, also known as the Lamplighter city Series because uh, when he went mainstream with it, the uh, Monster Blood Tattoo was not considered a good title for school libraries and so he changed the title of the series to lamplighter but that's all he changed all he changed about it uh that's a cool setting because it's a fantasy setting set in uh more of a tricorn dickensian kind of a world uh rather than your traditional medieval fantasy um but it's kind of gonzo in that respect actually even though it's dark and weird and twisted uh let's see Yeah, the oldest character in the universe is my dog, and that's cool. I mean, uh, we've talked about that before. You know, he's, he's two thousand years old NASA scientist. I'm a survived Greek cataclysm. Yeah, and he's like basically a brain in a jar. He's a psychic brain or magic brain in a jar. Um, but yeah, I mean, so simple things you can do, and and I, I wish I had more to say on this, but I don't think that it's 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 such a weird 
genre call that it's hard to really pin down solid things to say about it. You know, just simple things like, okay, we're going to take horses. And instead of having four legs, you're either going to give them more legs at six or maybe take a horse and put it on two legs. And now it's, you know, running around like an ostrich, but for all intents and purposes, it looks like a horse. It's kind of what they did in Wizards, if you think about it. Uh, the big floppy-eared bipedal mounts. Yeah, that is that is the you have to you have to play it serious. Um, I think you have to play it straight. You know when you know the tribe is praying to the giant nuclear missile that's bedecked with colorful paints. To them, it is very much a god. And it's only us viewing it from the outside that we can kind of snicker and go, okay, cool. We know that's a, that's a nuclear missile. Um, that's okay. Your, uh, your typos are in good company, but yeah, it's just, it's the weird little things, you know, um, nor have your normal people do interesting things to, to, to make them stand out. Your groups of people in your in your Gonzo settings should be visually identifiable, um, not necessarily you know with their their ethnicity, though you can. And sometimes it's just a matter of color palette. It can be a human, maybe they have purple skin, or they could be humans and paint themselves with you know the purple clay of you know whatever valley they live in. Maybe they wear strange feathers different masks different accoutrement that that you know makes them look exotic and different and out there could be that what makes them gonzo is that in a world of very very fantastic things they're wearing suits and to them that is that is the way they wear it because that's the way that they that they, the, the the ancients dressed back in the times before the fall and so they go around wearing you know suits and ties or whatever passed for suits and ties before the fall and they go about their life and their little enclave out in the wasteland is arranged like you know 1950 suburbia and you play it straight when your party comes into that village they're like this is weird as fuck because these guys are not living in ramshackle shanties or the skulls of giant beasts or crashed spaceships they're living in split level suburban ramblers, you know, <laughs> they're out there mowing their lawns. Now their lawnmower may be an insect, but they're mowing the lawn and there you go. You've got some gonzo. Uh, let's see village of mutants and some villagers have very consistent mutation. Uh, stable mutations is a thing. I mean, Gamma World has it all over the place. If you think about, you know, most of the monsters in the bestiary or bestiary before I summon Yogg, um, is uh, are stabilized mutants. You know, you've got herps and hoops and you know batters and you know all of those guys are all kind of stabilized. There may be the occasional mutant between them, but they're the ones who have sort of. Uh, you know, they've, they've come to a consistent set of mutations. Uh, let's see. You know, humans, but three feet tall. I mean, honestly, it's funny. I was looking for images for Gonzo. Um, and I was going to pull up a bunch of them, but I decided not to because the one that kept coming up that really sung it to me is Mobius. If you've ever seen, seen any of Mobius's art, there's, there's all, if you had to study one artist to figure out what Gonzo was, just look at Mobius. Mobius's art covers a wide range from fantasy to sci-fi and everything in between. And it's always a little kooky. It's always a little odd, little weird visual cues uh, that set it apart. Even his most normal characters have something going on with them that makes them a little bit larger in life and more gonzo. Um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, there are plenty of others. Don't get me wrong, Mar, Mar Hawkman. Uh, yeah, I'm not saying that there aren't other artists. It's just that every time I was looking online for images that I could pull up, the best of them that I can find and the most consistent ones I could find 
were were Mobius. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, De Alex Toth, um, Jim Cody, Philippe Dulé, I'm going to mispronounce that. And of course, I already mentioned it, Jack Kirby. Jack Kirby's stuff is a great idea, great uh, version of Gonzo uh, stuff. Um, and I suppose I should set Gonzo is often considered kind of psychedelic and it can be but it's not like Sienkiewicz psychedelic if you've ever seen anything by, by Sienkiewicz like his New Mutants run where you can barely follow what's going on in the panels because it's so trippy and weird um, you know that's you know there's there are definitely degrees um, you know some of uh, if you're looking at um God, what's his name? The guy who did like Cobalt 60 and uh, God, I can't remember his name. Um, he, he's a good example too for a sillier v version of, because he did kind of comedy cartoony characters, but um, yeah, his, uh, his stuff is really good too for looking at uh, for, uh, for Gonzo stuff. I mean, honestly, any, uh, just go peruse the pages of a heavy metal magazine or metal hurling. Um, and you'll see a lot of that, uh, European, European artists, fantasy and science fiction artists do tend to lean more into that Gonzo. But an, I think another, I mean, another example of Gonzo art that I think a lot of a lot of people in the stream might be familiar with this. Just look at the stuff that was done in the original Fiend Folio. It was a little, it was over the top and in a really weird way. And I would say it, it's a good example of like Gonzo dark fantasy. In like everything was kind of bulgy eyes and heavy lines and weird. Uh, yeah, Bodie, that's it, Mark Bodie. Um, so uh, you know, it's. It's uh, the stuff that was in that original uh, Fiend Folio. I'd say there's a lot of it that would be Gonzo, uh, and a lot of you know early D and D monsters are Gonzo and could easily fit. Like for example, look at the Odiog from D and D. It's a classic of D and D. It's been there since the original Monster Manual, maybe even earlier. Although I think it first appears in the original Monster Manual, the Odiog is very gonzo. You could easily see it rising out of the pit in an old 70s, you know, early 80s animated short with its tentacles flailing and its eye stalks with the triple eyes coming down the middle and its big giant mouth coming out of a pit of slime while some scantily clad sacrifice screams and a bunch of priests stand around, you know, muttering and chanting. The Odiug could definitely fit that that uh, that role. Uh, the Odiug is in all in, is in a lot of ways the Gonzo version of what inspired it, which was the Dianaga from Star Wars, um, which is something I only recently learned, but it makes perfect sense now. I'm just like because the origins of D and D monsters is something that I'm really interested in. There's the, there's the classics like the Rust Monster and the Albear, you know that you know that came from the old plastic Chinese toys. Um, but uh, the Odiug I recently learned is very likely and most most assuredly inspired by the the trash compactor monster from star wars um and it makes sense both live in junk both have an eye stock both have tentacles and both try to eat you so it's it's basically the trash compactor monster and giving the timing of the monster manual and the star wars movies pretty undeniable um even though it's never been officially stated, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that. But I digress. The point is, is that the 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 Odiog is a good example of like a Gonzo monster. You know, an orc may or may not be Gonzo. I would say the pig-faced orcs from classic D and D. While I've always attested that the pig-faced orcs are actually what happens when you give a metaphorical general description to an artist and don't specify and don't give notes. Cause I think it's really a case of an artist taking them far too, far too literally. Um, uh, but still those pig faced orcs be a 
great example of like a gonzo humanoid race. If you're going to take regular Tolkien orcs and then D&D pig-faced orcs, you got like your normal fantasy guys and then your gonzo fantasy guys. Um, yeah, I don't know where it got its name, but, uh, you know, uh, it, there's some, when I was, when I was looking it into, looking into it, I think there's possibly some actual language origins for the word. Um, but I can't, I can't remember. It, it definitely is spelled like something that comes from an actual language. It's also just so obscure that it's either Cthulhu-esque gibberish or drawn from uh, some some language somewhere. Um, but yeah, and definitely, as I mentioned, heavy metal is the standard because in any issue of heavy metal, you're going to be presented with a lot of uh, gonzo um, uh, images. And I guess surrealism and gonzo bleed into each other, but I would say that um, you don't have to be overly surreal to be Gonzo. Um, just because you can have you can have Gonzo stuff that's pretty consistent, and solid, and, and defined um, in a way that surrealism often isn't. It, you know, it's Gonzo is not abstract, though. Um, yeah, that's the other thing. You definitely want some form and structure, and um, but yeah. Um, what I find interesting about the Odeog is that at some point they decided that the Odeog itself was not good enough and they had to make then the Neo Odeog. And I never realized, I never quite figured out like what, why they did that. Uh, as far as I understand, the Neo Odeog is basically just an up powered Odeog. Um, yeah. Although, interestingly enough, if you look at the old Odeog st statistics, there are some versions of it that actually had the ability to speak to you telepathically and get into your mind, and then it really gets Lovecraftian at that point. Um, there are also really great monsters to have small, low-level encounters worshipping them. Have, like, some tribe of savages somewhere in your setting, or humanoids in your setting, that worship a monster in a cave and have it be an Odeog. Um because the Odeog is not so powerful that it's going to obliterate your party, uh, but it is a big monster. And so for like low-level monsters, it's it's a pretty good like uh, boss monster. <laughs> <laughs> Write out words from any of the Dravidian languages and it looks like algebra writing. Um, I am not familiar with the Dravidian languages. Um, uh, yeah, the Odeog is nasty enough as it is. Uh, one of my favorite encounters with Odeog, with an Odeog is in early 5th edition? No, it's 3rd edition. We were, we were actually playing 3rd edition. Um, had two brothers were playing in my group, and the younger brother was playing a halfling. And when I say younger brothers, they're both teenagers. Um, uh, his halfling goes walking down, th walking through this uh, this cavern full of mushrooms, basically a mushroom forest, and he's walking down this path. And from either side, Odiugs start whipping their tentacles at him, and basically we went for several rounds of this halfling getting whipped around through the air between these two Odiugs who were basically trying to do the sort of orca thing where you whip your pray around and try and stun it. Meanwhile, the rest of the party is trying to get to him. It was fun. I had not heard them called that, um, but uh, I don't know. I, 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 I hesitate to characterize another, another language in such a way. Mm, you know, saying that they look eldritch. Um, you know, more like I would say it's it's fair it's more fair to say that eldritch languages borrowed heavily from those languages when trying to represent themselves and I'm sure there's some sort of you know at least low key racism going on there but that's just me 
I wouldn't even I wouldn't necessarily call it racism as far as much as cultural insensitivity and just naivete. I mean, we've all done it. That looks exotic. Therefore, I'm going to write it into my game. Um, you know, said it before, you know, your folklore monster may very well be somebody's actual religion. So, so be careful. Um, I was recently kind of disappointed that when Osprey Games did uh, their Silver Bayonet expansion for Canada and they put the Wendigo in there, uh, that they used the modern pop cultural Wendigo with the uh, skeletal deer head and all of that rather than the more, I guess, orthodox um actual version from native belief which is just a desiccated emaciated human who's hungry all the time uh but that's me i prefer what yeah i feel like we're at a day and age where we can be a little bit more authentic with our monsters and still have them be cool there are so many monsters from from various cultures that really in their own right can be presented in fiction um and still be worthy and have merit. But soapbox aside, um, it's my channel. I'll soapbox if I want to. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. So this is because a lot of science fiction scripts that are used. So we can only we can only really write or imagine what we know that's the that's the harsh part about human imagination is even the most imaginative humans tend to still have some basis in something they have seen something they've experienced or something they know then we may be able to shuffle them around and and reiterate but at the end of the day we are prisoners in our own minds we can't conceive of something whole cloth and so a lot of sci-fi languages look like other languages that have been simplified, modified, um, you know, or at least they have their origins starting somewhere in a real language, real script. Um, and so, yes, examples of Hindi writing that look like alien writing, it's more there are examples of alien writing that look like Hindi writing because authors, artists have looked at writing from other cultures and 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 done that i mean if you look at if you look at crop circles right crop circles in and of themselves look alien but they're not so alien when you look at other languages that are out there um so it's and also those are just more geometric shapes that are combined in but they're still geometric shapes um so anyways uh so gonzo stuff like i said not a heavyweight topic um there are few examples in animation that you can really turn to um uh, pirates of dark water that's another gonzo series i would say it's everything is a little bit amped up i guess that's a good point if you're, it, it, it helps when you're doing Gonzo to have a theme that you're going to lean your Gonzo to. So Pirates of Dark, Dark Water is Gonzo nautical, uh, uh, you know, a Gonzo water world. So everything is geared towards being slightly nautical or aquatic. If you remember, they had the weird pistols that were actually the little creatures that squirted acid or whatever out and you know um you know, you know even the monkey birds in there were a combination of birds and monkeys both things that get kind of mixed in with pirate uh, pop culture um so yeah i mean picking a theme is is a good way to go um th you know the wizards movie is post-apocalyptic fantasy Gonzo. Honestly, it, the Wizards is it's such a good template because we have a world that has magic in it. We have a world that has fairies in it. We have a world that has elves and brownies in it. But it also has mutants and it is our world because of course, you know, there's the Nazi references in there and that means that, you know, you know, the whole like, you know, 
the reason that, you know, Black Wolf is, you know, the way he is. He's, you know, basically a neo-Nazi, neo-fascist. Um, and so we have a, there a sort of gamma worldy type setting where we mix and match a lot of things. Um, is the truth of it that all the elves, fairies, and brownies are just various types of stabilized mutants? Could be. Um, we definitely see that there are mutant monsters in that world when we look at Black Wolf's army. Um, and then he's got his sort of human guys, the guys in the gas masks, you know, Fritz, Fritz, you killed Fritz. But when you show the rest of his, heart, his, 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 his army and stuff, it's like goblins and demon looking things that could just easily be mutants. Uh, Vampire Hunter D is a good example of a gonzo surreal fantasy setting for sure. Yeah, just Wizards is really the best example. Or, like I said, going through the comics, you know, like Bodhi comics are a good one. I'm horrible with artist names, and I unfortunately I don't have any of the, the heavy metals that I owned when I was a kid. They just didn't survive growing up and moving out and and all of that um but yeah there's just you cannot open up a page of of um, uh, heavy metal also another entry into that same genre of magazines slightly more tame though would have been marvel's uh, epic imprint um when they were doing the epic magazine uh, i used to pick up a lot of stuff from them that had really good solid like you know gonzo surreal stuff but so as i am running out of things to say i'm gonna go ahead and if people want to come on and talk about it um be my guest because i am kind of running out of steam on this topic it's not a huge one it's maybe more of a of a topic for discussion um but i would say if we're going to come on and we're going to talk about it let's not try to over talk one particular topic of it like definitely want to hear folks favorites folks input on it but um we're not here to talk about your favorite animation and go into a deep dive on that so if you want to come on and talk that's cool um i'm always open for a good conversation um but uh also if you have questions or you want to throw out some 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 tidbits to start conversation put them in the chat um you know it, it, vampire hunter d is a is a good character um he's a he's a complicated character uh, i've only seen the original movie i've never read any of the the manga or anything like that but uh if this is the end of the topic and there's nothing else to discuss i may call it a short stream and and you know you know i leave myself open till noon but i i, I fully admit that some of these streams are uh not gonna go for two two hours oh i kind of buried the lead but i actually hit 200 subscribers for my channel and as of this morning i looked and i had 201 now that's not a lot by some standards but uh definitely big for me for somebody who streams once a week and doesn't do a lot with his stream and for somebody who actually had quit their channel years ago and only revived it recently in the last year or so um i think it's doing pretty good um still trying to figure out if if or what i should do for 200 i mean i feel like i should do something um but uh i'll let you guys know Let's see. What else we got going on? Let's see. Well, yeah, they were originally books. Um, and quite good. So I think that was what Vampire Under D was sort of the uh, that the Japanese novelizations, kind of like where Legend of Galactic Heroes uh, started, um, where there's this weird twilight zone between like normal novelizations and manga where they sort of meet in the middle. can't remember what the name of those is, but I think that's where Vampire Hunter D started. Um, but yeah, let's see. What do we got here? 
Yeah, I think this is, you know, look at 70s album covers or any of the modern, like, stoner rock album covers, uh, and you can just pull pull straight away. And, uh, yeah. Well, Cody, uh, you can say it in the comments if you want, and then I can talk to it. Um, yeah, I, 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 I wish you could come on too, but I understand if, if, you know, if your wife has something going on. So that is a thing. All right. So, uh, other than that, I am, I was on Max's stream, his big old, you know, 24 hour charity stream. I have to, I have to laugh on that one because evidently, and I wasn't even aware of this, but a while back there was some rumor that he and I had beef and I'm like, no, I, you know, I, I don't agree with everything he says, but that's being human. And I'm a big enough person where I don't have to agree with you on all points. Uh, even if I seriously disagree with you, if you are a decent person and treat me with respect and treat others with respect, then we can talk. Um, and if I could soapbox a bit again, I think we could use more of that these days. You know, we're never going to move past our differences or figure out our differences or, you know, grow if we cannot learn to stop and talk and listen. Yeah, actually, we need to listen more than we need to talk. Um, so, but being open to hearing other points of view, even if you disagree with them, and then dis and then had discussed that, it's important. You know, I would like to talk to this, but I haven't had a chance to run many Gonzo games. Honestly, I, because most of my my life, I have run D and D, um, and Star Wars, um, and Star Frontiers, uh, and superhero games. I've never really had a chance to dip a toe into Gonzo. Um, something I've been wanting to do forever. It's something that uh, I very much um, am interested in doing. I sometimes doubt whether or not I can get crazy enough to do true Gonzo justice. Um, you may have noticed I tend to be a little restrained. Um, that's just me. But my D&D worlds tend to be pretty gritty and realistic. And uh, my superhero games, um, you know, they were superhero games. I'm a... I, my, my core for understanding the superhero vibe is the 80s and then the 90s for the most part. Um, so that really informs my style of superhero play. Star Frontiers is its own thing. Um, it has its own vibe built into it. And if you're playing an IP-based universe like Star Wars, well, you're playing Star Wars and you try to make it feel like Star Wars. Um so, yeah, I haven't really had a chance to run a lot of Gonzo things. There are Gonzo elements that have worked into my games sometimes. I think the most Gonzo I've ever played was back when I was younger. And my D&D &D character got pulled into space. And then I went on this madcap journey of my character rising to power in the Star Empire and doing that. Um, so, uh, look, uh, we have Mar Hawkman coming on here. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How's it going? That thing you just said about, about uh, uh, superheroes, the first exposure I had to the superhero genre was the old Super Friends cartoon. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, Super Friends, I think... Uh, funny enough, if you go far enough back, a lot of the cartoons back in that same era were pretty gonzo. I mean, I grew up on oh, things yeah. like, like Black Star, uh, the original uh, Flash Gordon cartoon... Um, you know, there's Thundar, of course, you mentioned, but, you know, Herculoids, um, you know, Space Ghost, uh, things like that, you know, those all have that. And then, of course, there's early Super Friends and even like Spider-Man and his amazing friends and all of that. Those all had a very, because they were, they were, they were directed at children, but children of the 70s and 80s. Well, one thing with... Oh with the challenge of the super friends is it was 
a DC Comics adaptation from before Crisis on Infinite Earths, when they decided that they wanted to do away with the idea of, ha of playing with alternate universes. So in Challenge of the Super Friends, there's this one episode where they're chasing the Legion of Doom and jump through like five different alternate universes, each one more strange and bizarre than the last. <laughs> Well, I mean, honestly, I think saying that Challenge of the Super Friends is something they dis they did before they decided to. Yes, chronologically, that's true. But I mean, Challenge of the Super Friends is really just a product of its time. DC Universe at the time was not serious comics. Yeah, um, it, 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 it was back when comics were, well, gonzo in the mainstream. <laughs> DC more so at that time than Marvel, though, I think. Um, yeah. And then, of course, you know, we're talking about characters who I don't think a lot of people know how to write for. You know, Superman is notoriously hard for people to get right um, because he's, you know, considered often really flat by a lot of people. A lot of the DC characters are really powerful, honestly. Uh, but also, I think the one thing that made it Gonzo is DC has a lot of the more, I don't know, weird, weird villains. Uh, it seemed in my brain. I know Marvel has its fair share, but I think when I was so when I was growing up, there was always this idea that if you wanted serious comics, you read Marvel. If you wanted goofy comics, you read DC. And they sort of every so often seem to, you know, weave back and forth onto which side they are. Um, but yeah, and and so Challenge of the Super Friends was was definitely one of those ones that was I think a combination of a few things: the time it was made in the audience it was made for and the budget and creative leeway that it was given by the studio. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't think it was ever given a pretty heavy budget. So there was a lot of simple animation. Uh, the characters were often simplified and didn't get into some of the darker aspects. I mean, let's, let's, let's face it. I mean, you know, Solomon Grundy is, well, that a was zombie. probably, yeah, he's, a, he's, a, he's a giant zombie. Uh, mm -hmm. Although I think, that wasn't Challenge of the Super Friends era. I think that was the, oh. uh, what, what is it? They Because they, they just had the Super Friends, and then they did Challenge of the Super Friends. Challenge of the Super Friends, I think, actually may have been the Grundy part, because that's where I think the Legion of Doom came in. Oh, yes. With the Darth Vader helmet base that they had. But um, Oh, uh, Challenge of the Super Friends, in terms of like going dark, there's one episode where they f fight this guy who is hinted but not stated to be literally Satan incarnate. And he's just screwing with them. And they, in the end of the, the episode, you find out they didn't defeat the bad guy. They actually gave the bad guy what he wanted. And we don't know why the bad guy actually wanted what they gave him, because what they gave him was seemingly to destroy his minions. And why did he want the super friends to destroy his minions? Yeah. <laughs> well, and, I mean, let's let's. We, we, I we, just we, imitated the laugh he did at the end of the episode uh, on accident. <laughs> we get into um, Spider Man and his amazing friends. We had that creepy ass episode with Swarm, where people get taken over and turned into mindless bee drones. So, you know, it's like, <laughs> um, and go around chanting Swarm, Swarm, um, and which, as a kid, that creeped me out because uh, they grew antennas and they got bug eyes but uh there was that and then video man for whatever reason video man kind of creeped me out when i was a kid too i don't know if it was just his style or whatever but uh, yeah it was kind of creepy but yeah i mean i know you're a huge thundar fan um and so am i i like thundar thundar's got a lot to unpack when it comes to both post-apocalyptic post-apocalyptic gaming and then also uh that gonzo gaming style uh no surprise because it's got jack kirby's fingerprints all over it um, but again, you know, challenge of the Herculoids, you know, here's an example of sort of prehistoric barbarian characters with sort of a rhinoceros, Actually, triceratops. Sort as someone of a... who watched, as far as I know, every episode of that when I was a teenager, there is actually something in Herculoids that's a very, very rarely mentioned plot point that redefines the setting in a way that's insane and weird it's actually an alien planet in deep space well, i know that 
It, it's just I'm talking about its presentation, though. It's an alien. Yeah. It is an alien planet. But what do we have? We have a family who are the only ones of their kind on the planet for the most part. Um, yeah. You know, we've got life forms that are almost things that we know, but slightly different. A good example. Like, like a giant uh, ape made out of molten rock. That is right there. A huge gonzo thing. So let's say you're writing this up in your game, bringing it back to the topic, gaming and gonzo. If you're going to go ahead and have your your party run into a giant ape, why not make it... All you need to do is take that and twist the dial a little bit more. Now it's a giant rock ape. You don't even have to do any stat changes for a giant ape to a giant rock ape, and they're not gonna they're not gonna care. They're not gonna know. Now, if you dial it up a little bit more and it becomes a lava ape, you might have to change some stuff because you know there's the the fire and the heat thing. But you could still play it straight because I mean I you know like if you look at He Man for example, which is another great example of Gonzo. Uh, He-Man is an excellent example of Gonzo, and if you dial it forward a little further, Thundercats is pretty Gonzo because Thundercats had, face it, we had like robot teddy bears and space pirates and mutants and everything. You know, basically, again, whatever the whatever the writers were smoking that week made it onto 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 Third Earth there. Um, <laughs> but you know, and and He-Man was a great combination of fantasy and sci-fi. You know, he's got a magic sword, but he rides around on a battle track. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and yep. you know, there's a dragon in there, but you know, and then of course, you know, He Man's mom is from Earth. You know, so you know, Adam's mom is from Earth, uh, which it's funny. It takes forever for them to even reveal that, if I recall. Like, well, I mean, not later, it's it's actually why his like uh, normal p person name when he's not turned into He Man is Adam. <laughs> yeah, I mean he's he's got an Earth name. Uh, <laughs> um, hey RPG Grandma, uh, you slipped in here. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, Herculoids is good. Ghostbusters, yes, the Ghostbusters cartoon and movie is a good example. Um, well, uh, you, you were talking earlier about the Herculoids. Yes. Do you know why it is that I know that the, that Herculoids are on an alien planet and not a weird alternate version of Earth? I'm pretty sure it's actually in the opening credits, but okay. <laughs> uh, crossover episodes with Space Ghost. Did those happen in its original run, or, or is that a more of a modern thing? I genuinely don't remember, but I what I do remember though is that it was it was a planet that Space Ghost could visit if he wanted to. He usually was doing other things elsewhere. Space Ghost ca often came to the aid of the Herculoids and vice versa as the original Space Ghost series Council of Doom storyline where they teamed up. Okay. Um, I mean, it was made by the same production company in the same time period. So, you know. Yeah. Uh, looks like there was at one point a Space Stars uh, TV block on NBC, which is uh, ran from 81 to 82. And that's where where they, their crossovers occurred because it included Space Ghost and the Herculoids. So, oh, that that is probably why. See, when I saw it, it wasn't the original run. It was like when it was rebroadcast on Cartoon Network. Oh. And one thing I remember from Cartoon Network rebroadcasting it was that they would often pair like half length episodes of Space Ghost with Herculoids. Yeah. Well, they they I don't. So here's the deal. I, I, I with those older episodes based on on the wiki page for it at least um they would have been about the length of half episodes uh, because uh, yeah it's a single 30 minute time slot uh 22 minute time slot two 11 minute segments is what the hercules episodes were running so you get two stories per segment that was kind of the, the way that they would work back in the day is yeah. your your show would get two short stories because kids don't have long attention spans we forget that having a full half hour dedicated to one story like we see nowadays is is a relatively new invention as far as kids programming you know like my my niece is over this weekend and uh we were watching uh gravity falls this morning talk about gonzo weirdness um and uh those not only is that 
full length episodes, but it's got meta plot. Now, when I was a kid, barely anything had a meta plot, let alone like full length episodes. It wasn't until you get into like the mid to late eighties where we start getting the 30 minute toy advertisements that you see the, the, you know, the full episodes, you know, He-Man, G.I. Joe, Transformers, Thundercats, I mean, things like that. One thing that was an actual like premise that was like a, a legitimate uh, factor that the people would take into account when writing the, uh, the old uh, serial stuff was the mm, idea serial. that you needed to be able to see the episodes in a randomly uh, reorganized order and have them still make sense. Therefore, almost nothing would actually reference a previous episode directly. Yeah, because everything was made made as as to be syndicated, and you might get a to be continued, you know, one two episode. And syndication didn't want to need to worry about showing them in the right order. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's when you start. That's why some of the early in the early days of deeper storytelling, why some of those series has suffered. Uh, Galaxy Rangers, for example, a great series, but it often suffered from A, being in a shit-tastic time zone, at least in my area. You know, you had to get up at like five in the morning, six in the morning to watch that. Uh, and what kid does that? Um, and if I am doing that, I'm probably getting ready to go to school. Um, and then, you know, they would play them out of order a lot of times. Um, but yeah, I, you know, those early cartoons, Herculoids, and and you know, but you you can see it all through. And and today we still have them. Adventure Time. If you've ever watched Adventure Time, that actually does series. have have. A, uh, yeah, it, it goes really really heavy on the Gonzo. Like like it it has some weird Gonzo stuff in it that I was like, oh, they're going to do that now. Okay. Yeah, um, if you like, like the, the, the various uh, episodes with, with Finn trying to get a new sword, and one of the swords is actually created by taking a clone of Finn and turning it into a sword somehow. Why? Why? Hey, you know, <laughs> if you can have demon blades where it's a demon, um, the the it always reminds me of one of the nastiest Warhammer fantasy things I ever saw back in the old school Warhammer world was. It was a bloodthirster demon that had the twin, the, the 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 conjoined twin mutation. So it was basically two bloodthirster torsos. Bloodthirster is a greater demon of corn. Two bloodthirster torsos off of one set of legs, and each bloodthirster was wielding a demon axe, which is effectively a full-on demon in weapon form. So in game terms, you had one monster that had double the attacks of the monster plus then the attacks of the monster again on each axe so it was like because it was two bloodthirsters each one having a bloodthirster in axe form and so potentially on the table it was something like 10 or 15 attacks per turn <laughs> from this greater demon in a war game it was just a nightmare you had to roll it randomly but it was one of those weird random things that that that, that occurred once we were playing it but um you know talking about magic items from from souls and stuff like that but yo i mean there are other ones too i mean if you think about um if you ever caught kippo hmm. um it's a netflix series i believe it's a nah, it's I, gamma I, world it's basically it's gamma world it's uh, it's a post apocalypse where Humans are in enclaves, and there are mutants all over the place. Um, and it's it's cool. It's it goes for a couple of series. It's it's a fun one. Um, it's definitely over the top and Gonzo-ish. Uh, if I recall correctly, there is a frog in there who is like an evil overlord. But uh, this is pretty cool. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I know you're, you're talking about the one not based on the movies. You're talking about the one with the ape and all of that. Um, uh, but I, I think that's what you're talking about. But uh, even the 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 one that was the real Ghostbusters um, was uh, um, really kind of gonzo. They did a lot of just goofy stuff. Well, one of the things that, that uh, was an an interesting thing to see in an interview about Star Trek, the animated series was that um, 
Gene Roddenberry himself said that one of the things that he liked about having it being animated meant that they didn't need physical sets, so they could just throw the crew into any sort of weird uh, nonsense uh, uh, that they could imagine and uh, come up with a way to have an artist draw and just run with it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I remember the animated series is the one it, it came up with a great answer to why they could always beam down to any planet and not have to worry about dying. They had the four, they had the uh, life support belts that surrounded themselves with a, a minor force field to keep air and atmosphere and, and shield out particles. Um, yeah, I mean, like, that's always the benefit of an animated series, though, is you are not limited in any way in your ability to to do models and stuff. Well, see, the, the force field belts, though, actually had a, a practical uh, thing for animation, though, is that they didn't have to have a separate model sheet for them wearing uh, spacesuits. They would just uh, uh, put a, a little like layer over the regular one. Well, I know that. It's just, it, but it also was an in-universe answer to why they never wore I mean, spacesuits it, it, going down to an alien planet. In, in universe, it actually makes sense too because they actually do use force fields for holding the air in on the ship and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, 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 but we didn't. We never saw that in the live action because. And it would have been such an easy prop for them to make, honestly, cheaper than when they did the spacesuit in the few episodes they had that spacesuit. Because honestly, they would have just had to give them a little, like, you know, Power Rangers belt module and called it good. They could have probably gone out and glued a fake rhinds, a fake, you know, gemstone onto, like, um, you know, a giant belt buckle and called it a piece of tech. Uh -huh. You know, and, and nobody, and all they would have had to do is, you know, push their finger on it, make a boop sound effect and maybe, you know, and then say, okay, you know, force field belts are activated and, and they could have got away with it, mm -hmm. but they didn't. Yeah. Um, and then when that animated episode comes around, we're like, Hey, cool. You know, you know, we, you know, we see why it is that they're able to walk around and stuff. And I always just thought that was cool when watching it, but that I would say this is one of the things I, one of the problems I have when animation tries to go live action is that, we then lose a lot of what made the animation work. And even if they, even if it's computer animated, because computer animation tends to have to generally try to, at least if it's done as like the modern, like 3d, you know, photorealistic animation has its limits in that regard. You can still do animation, obviously, and have it be weird and surreal and all that, but you then often sacrifice the photorealism. That, that's actually one of the things with, C, uh, with uh, the CGI work done for Babylon 5 that was so interesting is that the people creating the series knew the limits of the CGI and didn't try to ask the CGI artists to do things they couldn't do. So, you know, having an alien spaceship that has a glossy green hull, okay. Yeah, that's easy. Ha ha having it be nearly completely smooth and have a veiny texture imposed on it to make it have the feeling of being a techno organic. Sure, easy. <laughs> yeah, but there are other things that are harder to do, like weird swirling patterns and stuff, just because of cost. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to get into that really surreal kind of gonzo y twisty stuff, then it gets more expensive. You can do it, but your budget goes up. And at that point, you might as well do it in in 2d animation where you don't have to worry about the 3d of it you just have to fake the 3d of it you know you get your perspectives and stuff like that well one thing i i realized watching babylon 5 as a teenager was that the visual effect of the uh, jump gate opening was stock footage they, 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 they rendered the animation once with no ship and then would just replay that anytime they wanted to show the gate uh opening well, that's 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 how you would do it, anyways. I mean, you wouldn't. You, you'd be dumb if you rendered that individually every time, yeah, especially but, when you're already using computer assets, because all you have to do is change what ship comes out of the gate. Right, right, right. Uh, but yeah. you could, uh, if if you're going to re-render re it individually for each episode, actually show more than just the gate by itself, and. I noticed it because I, I realized that I was seeing the gate from the same angle every single time. 
Well, fortunately, they only had to worry about a four by three aspect ratio and they could they, we could get away with having a tight frame because we can only fit so much on screen. It might be a bit more problematic on a 16 by nine or modern format because you'd have to have more screen real estate. Well, also, they, they, they would do things like jump cutting from, say, Ivanova talking to someone on inside uh, the, the station and a jump cut directly to the gate. Yes, so, that, so, that's budget 101, though. <laughs> so, so you know, they, they don't have like a panning shot of space where they pan to the gate. It's just zip, zip. <laughs> well, and honestly, panning shots are something you really can't afford in a TV episode. They're, so we're still talking about TV episodes at that point. And in addition to budget and screen real estate, um, you do have to worry about pacing. And so in a feature length film, you can, you can justify a, a nice slow pan or a creeping, you know, a nice little, you know, you know, move across kind of creeping shot easier than you can in say a, even an hour long TV episode where you've got to be done in an hour. Um, and what are you going to do? Fit in more dialogue or worry about panning to the, I mean, we did get some cool exterior shots when we needed to, and often those were even stockish, where you'd see a, an exterior shot of the of, of the station with the little worker drones flying around and all that, and then they'd go inside. But you don't have unlimited budget, especially Babylon 5, where they were lucky to even get the show made in the first place, and the dude was doing all of that animation on an Amiga. <laughs> so... Yeah. Well, I another mean, thing that was I, I thought of with Babylon Five though is that that series actually did go pretty gonzo when it came to alien tech, because you know you have the Earth Force tech, you have the tech the Narns use, the Centauri, and certain other well-established races, and then you have the the, the races that you don't necessarily even have names for. You're like, oh, we found a weird artifact on a planet. We don't know where it came from. <laughs> yeah, but so much of that was probably raided from their existing prop room. How much of the Centauri stuff was just Roman set dressing or Renaissance set dressing that they could just pull in from their existing prop shop? Well, yeah, but I, well, mean, well, I, I was just looking at this from the aspect of writing it, though, is because the fact that since it was an alien race that we don't even know who is, they could just write it as doing uh, pretty much anything they wanted it to. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that's 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 kind of part and parcel i mean you you know that's what i was saying earlier too about the problem there is that we can't imagine outside of ourselves and so whatever you were to put on the alien something or other is going to look like something mm -hmm. you know it's like even if it's a completely you know, alien species and so different topic here but you you reminded me of one of the uh, you know i'm going to venture into my miniature design uh background here and it's not a huge background so don't think i'm some pro dude or anything but so one of my big things for doing my miniatures range is i didn't do any humans um there are so many 15 millimeter ranges of humans and 28 millimeter ranges of humans out there that i was not going to do humans i bent a little bit when i did my wasteland uh, line because i wanted some good road warrior type characters but uh for my science fiction stuff i did just alien races and there's always a call in miniatures for alien aliens truly alien aliens you know the really weird stuff and the problem with the really weird stuff is there's this weird you know you i'm you, i'm i know you're familiar with the uncanny valley you know and, and and you know the whole idea that you know you reach a certain point where something looks so human that it it starts to look alien and weird and we it creeps us out there's a similar thing with alien design where as you climb towards maximum alienness, you start to lose. There's a, there's a dip in the audiences and audience, whether that's a viewing audience on TV or in the case of this, you know, miniatures is a visual medium. So it, you can still consider it an audience for your for your miniatures, guys. Especially considering people are going to use your miniatures, so they even have to worry about the interface. And uh, um, just a second here, I got to mute myself real quick.
So it might get a little loud here. We have an emergency laundry situation down here. So you might hear my washing machine running in the background because I'm in my basement and the washing machine is over there. I see. <laughs> but so where's going with the, with the miniatures design is so the more alien your miniature gets, there's a direct dip in the ability for the audience, the viewer, to understand it to kind of grok what you're going for here. So a truly alien alien, while everybody clamors for that and wants to see that in miniature or even on screen, there's always the risk of making your design unintelligible to the viewer. Uh, TV and movies have the benefit of being able to show you how it moves and actually show it in action. So that, that, that relationship is different than it is for a static medium like miniatures or even um, like an art piece. There are things you can do to counter that. For example, if you have a, and the, the equation I came up with, at least when I was working on my designs, is the more alien your, your body is for your alien, the more grounded its tech should be. Hmm. So, because if you have a really alien design and really alien tech, then you're, your viewer is going to go looking at that and go, where does the creature stop and its tech begin? Now, that may not be a thing because it could be that your tech and your creature are one and the same, and but that's a different thematic thing. But for the most part, when people are picking up a miniature, at least, they're looking for something that they can use and they can understand and it makes sense to them. So often when you're doing a more, in, a more unintelligible, weirder design, like you don't want to make a tentacly globular alien and then give him equipment that's a bunch of hoses and orbs. I mean, I I've mean, seen things where that'll basically just be like color coded. It's like this is his face. This is the color of his face. And anything but, that's the same color but, as his face. But the problem there is that's fine once it's colored. But remember, when a miniature goes out to a person, oh, it's yes. a blank. And uh, with and unless you have artwork figures. to associate it, I mean, like Games Workshop, for example, which is a giant company, doesn't have to worry about that because they have all the money in the world and they have staff artists who can render anything they come up with in full, amazing painted color with an accompanying animation and plush doll. Um, you know, but if you're just somebody who can just do, say, gray plastic or you know, you know, gray lead miniatures you are then going to have that limitation. Where I was going with that and kind of tying it back to the original topic is kind of with your gonzo. If your gonzo is so gonzo that people can't make sense of it, then it's pointless. You're actually venturing into abstraction and you're, you're, you're kind of beyond surrealism and now into that abstract universe where everything means everything and everything means nothing simultaneously. So, but uh, let's go to some of the comments here. RPG Grandma was talking about seeing amazing things with special effects and stage backgrounds. Um, spray painted ice trays, AstroTurf. Um, yeah, and you, I mean, you have to spend, you, you always are going to have to worry about what you're going to spend your money on prop wise, and then you're going to beg, borrow, and steal every prop you can, too. That's why so many of the early Klingon knives were like Mall Ninja wall hanger mm -hmm. knives. Uh, there, you know, that weird, like that stupid two bladed knife that you always see them giving Klingons in Star Trek, like the later Star Trek, like TNG and stuff. You could walk into any mall and buy that before it showed up on screen because that was your mall ninja wall hanger knife that was just a piece of crap, but it looked cool. Um, let's see, science fiction expense, sci, sci fi is expressive because, you know, special props and aliens. Yeah, are expensive. It, it is. Um, and that's why I think nowadays we see so much, well, beyond that tastes have changed to a bit over time, but we see far, far less amazing and imaginative science fiction these days and much more grounded sci-fi because it's just easier. Stargate is a good example. They never had to spend a bunch of money coming up with weird props for their main characters because their main characters pretty much just used military hardware and they reused the same aliens over and over and over. And then all the human cultures that they would run into, they could just give whatever costume they pulled from, you know, you know, 
whatever, you know, hey, here's our costumes for the last production of Jesus Christ Superstar we did. Okay, cool. Now everybody has, you know, got their biblical robes or here's, you know, the I Claudius stuff. So everybody's got Roman robes. And occasionally I mean, they would come it, up with an alien, but that, that allowed them to save all their budget for their aliens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, people have to relate to the mini and figure out how to paint it. And especially if you're trying to make game miniatures for use, and this is the other thing, is the use. Miniatures for art and for collection are one thing. Miniatures for use on a tabletop are another thing. Um, you know, there is, you know, because people are going to build armies out of them, or they're going to build encounters out of them, or whatever, and they need to know how to use them. Uh, you'll notice, like, in... The Fiend Folio, in the original Fiend Folio, the Grell, one of the most out of the out of this world weird creatures. We've got a floating brain with a kraken beak and tentacles coming off of its lower legs, and then it's wielding a spear. It's exactly the example I'm talking about. That Grell is a weird ass creature, but its equipment, its weapon is bog standard very believable and relatable which then allows you as the viewer to see what the grell is what it does if we were to give that grell a staff with 13 weird orbs off of it we're not quite as obvious about it you could describe it and that's of course what a monster listing has the benefit of doing is describing what that monster does and what they use but you always have to keep in mind your medium when you're designing something. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Stargate was budget friendly. I mean, the the most expensive Stargate has ever been, I think, is probably the original movie. <laughs> so, um, you know, because everything else was either CG later on or uh, costuming. And if, even if you think about, like, when they get brought the wraith into into Stargate, what are the wraith? They're humans who have Voldemort noses uh, and some interesting makeup effects and some and and some some fake teeth, but they're still humans. Um, and when you look at the wraith interiors, you don't see glowing doodads. You see stuff that looks like it's made out of neoprene rubber. Yeah, it's it's probably all that was probably all made with spray foam or carved foam that then had a skin of, of latex put over it mm -hmm. uh, with, with maybe the occasional bits of like pool noodle that worked in there as well. So, because I mean, there is actually one episode where Ronan Dex uh, takes a bunch of throwing knives and throws them at a wall panel to uh, disable it. And you see that they actually have, the throwing knives get stuck in the wall panel. It's not made out of metal. It's made out of some sort of uh, rubbery stuff. Well, and in in the in this in in universe, the wraith ships were all organic. Uh, yeah, all techno organic. And RPG Grandma, space vampires equals the wraith. Yes, but also, I always felt that there was a little bit of like dark elf mixed in there. Like, you take your space dark elves, and um, you know, uh, considering so much else in Stargate is pulling off of other myth mythologies and stuff. Um, but yeah. Uh... Well, actually, I would go with Space Vampire, but with, with a, a touch of some sort of, like, were-creature uh, thrown into it. Because we, we, what we find out about them is that the whole, like, Space Vampire thing is because they have DNA infused into them from some sort of horrifying parasitic bug. Well, that's that's still within modern uh, vampire parlance, you know. Right, right, but 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 that's we, why we get away, different from humans. I, I know, but there are so vampires in modern science fiction are often written as some sort of contagion or parasite, and so it and and also that's in keeping with the overall theme of Stargate, which is invasive thing. I mean, because you got the gold who are parasites. Um, you know, the only, you know, of course, then, of course, you get later on, you get to the Ori, which is a condemnation of modern Abrahamic religion. But, um, you know, which is one thing or another. That's just an interesting take, RPG Grandma. Flash Gordon as post apocalyptic. Um, I mean, I would say I, I'd be curious to hear why. 
Which I mean, which version of Flash Gordon are well, you specifically the, I'm, talking I mean, about? I'm not going to get into that because I don't want to direct to the comments. Any, please type for me in the comments if you can, RPG Grandma, why you think it's post-apocalyptic. I don't disagree with you. I am actually genuinely curious and not trying to argue with you because um, that's an interesting take I've never encountered before. Uh, let's see. So, um... I know like Buck Rogers is post-apocalyptic, at least in the 1980s one, mm -hmm. um, you know, because, you know, literally Earth is blown to crap, although they dial that back in season two. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Buck Rogers, actually, the Buck Rogers future, uh, the cities that are, are that, that, you know, when they show old Earth and stuff like that, um, or when they show the cities in Buck Rogers, uh, that is what I imagine the pre-apocalypse of Gamma World looking like. Because mm. Gamma World, the tech in Gamma World, which is all from before the fall, is like Star Trek level stuff. Um, you know, they've got ray guns and, you know, you know, medical healing devices that can heal you. And they talk about this grand future where they had fixed the earth and everything like that. So it's all going to be like weird spires and bubble cities, which is really weird because, and this, I actually, I made a post on this at one point because the art in Gamma world books does not match the description of the world that the, basically the ruins we're seeing in Gamma world look like the ruins of a 20th century city not a 24th century city, you know, a city that exists in a world where we've undone all the damage we did to the earth and found a way to not do any more damage to the earth and stuff. Clearly a city in that world would look different. There might be some remnants in classic architecture and stuff, but we should be seeing much more Buck Rogers and Jetson's architecture um, than we see downtown Chicago. Um, and then we have like art that shows, you know, the rabbits with the bolt action rifles, the description of guns in the original gamma world says that even projectile weapons work differently than we ever, than we conceive of them today. They don't use a gunpowder charge in a bullet. They use a hydrogen cell that creates the explosion that projects basically a round that's separate of itself, a slug. Um, they show a, a snake man in one of the pieces of art with his tongue slithering through a like 1950s era blade fan. Yeah. <laughs> now granted the artists in the seventies doing this are writing what they know. Seventies and eighties are doing this, writing what they know, but there's no attempt in the equipment that's depicted in a lot of the art to put any futurism in it at all. Even the cover of the box set for the original Gamma world shows a bombed out city. That is very much 20th century. The guys in the foreground are, very much spacey, but also completely not representative of anything you're going to be playing in the game, because those guys are uniformly equipped with all the high-tech gear they need. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's yeah, it's yeah, an interesting uh, disconnect in, the, in that original product. Um, let me take a look here. Okay, here we go. Here's our answer about kingdoms are all conquered, destroyed nations of Mongo, uh, and, the and, and the mutants exist. Um, landscape of Mongo is heavily scarred, Mongo moves around to string. I always thought that the the different species on Mongo were native species to their moons. Uh, I always thought like Mongo is basically supposed to be sort of like this big mega planet that had, you know, almost like Earth sized moons around it that people lived on. Um, but yeah, I. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it. I never got the sense that Mongo was post-apocalyptic. I just thought it was basically more kind of sword and planet, but mm. in a setting where you had multiple worlds that we hopped around through. It was a really good way to write a setting where you could jump world to world and not have to leave one world. Like, mm -hmm. because they were going around to the moons of Mongo. Um, but then again, my only exposure to Flash Gordon is very limited to the comic strips for Flash Gordon. A little bit of that as a kid, but where I really became aware of it was the cartoon for it that came out mm -hmm. before the live action movie came out. 
Uh, and then, of course, I've looked back into it since then. But, you know, I don't have a lot of classic Flash Gordon uh, exposure. Um, let's see. Mongo eventually six uh, in planets as its moons. Oh, uh, there we go. So, yeah, I mean, that's. That's cool. I mean, I I guess in a sense that it is post-apocalyptic if each if each of these planets that now becomes a moon of Mongo is having to exist in the aftermath of its destruction. I would say it's post-apocalyptic in that sense in the same way that uh, the Dark Ages is post-apocalyptic uh, Europe and how... Uh, the American Old West is basically, there's a good argument that it is a post-apocalyptic setting following the apocalypse that was the Civil War. That, that reminds me of, of something from the uh, movie where Ming is doing something with super tech to Earth. But yeah, he's don't... making acid, he's like making acid storms and you know burning rain and all of that. But, causing... but like, 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 what's the end goal of Ming's stuff? Uh, conquer Earth, like okay well yeah because the whole thing is he he comes so i mean in a way the way that rpg grandma is presenting this let's 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 look at this as a social political model okay you have mongo which is somehow devastated and post-apocalyptic in and of itself so let's say mongo is a world that has been conquered but in the in the in the in the in the process of a, of that conquest has been reduced to rubble to where it no longer has the means to support itself. But we are able to then make it able to move through super technology through space. It gains resources, because if you remember, like even in the movie, all the different moons are having to make tribute to, to Mongo and to Ming. Um, so he's kind of, instead of conquering countries, for their resources like we would see in, in in like an earthbound setting he's conquering moons to gain the resources that mongo needs but it's sort of a self-perpetuating thing because he he's, he basically consumes these moons resources enslaves them constantly creating the, the the need for more it's a mega consumer kind of alien race that is not self-sustaining and therefore you know the ants mongo's answer instead of figuring out technologies to allow it to exist in, you know, in, in harmony with its world or in a, in a sustainable manner eats up the resources of other worlds. I did think of a fictional setting that works very similarly to this, and it might actually have been inspired by this outworld and mortal Kombat. Not familiar enough with Mortal Kombat to know that. Okay, basically the, the the thing with it is that there's Mortal Kombat has a bunch of different planes, and the various characters, each of them comes from one of the planes. Sometimes they don't bother telling you which one when they introduce a character, but Outworld, Earthrealm, Edenia, and s several other planes. Well, one of the things that Outworld has done many times is taking other planes and fusing them into Outworld. Okay. Yeah, I. And, uh, so all of the people from that plane are now stuck in Outworld. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, you know, in in the context of that setting, I. Uh, one of the uh, there was a setting I was working on for a. I won't use the term steampunk. I'll use the term that I I I started with, which is Victorian science fiction. And I would say there is a distinction between those two, but I'm not going to go into it. Um. So back when I was into Victorian science, science fiction gaming, uh, Mars and Venus have both been done to death. Um, but because they weren't really even known back at that point, nobody's really touched the outer planets. And so I always had this idea of what would, what would a cool way to do the outer planets be for Victorian science fiction. And I focused on Jupiter and I basically made Jupiter sort of a Mongo um, in that, you have this big mega gas giant planet, which has like a bazillion moons. Like by today's standard, we know it has something like 90 some odd and pushing moons and little planetoids around it. Uh, which if we were to tweak that through the sensibilities of the time, the late 1800s, 
then they would probably see that and go, there's this giant world that has all these moons and an author would probably go, and each of these moons has a people on it. And so I created this sort of Mongo setting for Victorian science fiction setting that is Jupiter and its subsequent moons with all these. And although in my setting, Jupiter was actually alive and was like an eldritch thing almost. And the eye, the storm on Jupiter was actually the eye and the power base was there to keep the giant planet happy and quiet and so that's where the slavery of all the moons came in because they needed sacrifices and, and stuff like that so yeah I made my own little Mongo out of Jupiter for and set it in the 1800s Earth time <laughs> so that was fun it reminds me of this well to be honest uh, never mind that's okay well Hard science fiction, where they like to, don't try to be Gonzo and are just people in space, has actually done the concept of living on a moon of a gas giant. It's just that uh, the, the, the one I was thinking of, while it was a story I found to be memorable, the story actually wasn't that interesting other than uh, exploring the world that the people are living in and how it's different from Earth. Well, just remember, Endor is the moon of a gas giant. Yeah. Actually, if you look at the Star Wars planets, a good number of the planets in the Star Wars universe are actually moons surround uh, flying around uh, gas giants. Yavin. There, are, a lot of them are actually moons uh, and not not planets in their own right. Um, which always, which is interesting, because in some cases in Star Wars, they've got uh, people living on on moons and planets like mandalore you had mandalore the mandalore it's lived on its moon and its moon concordia but uh thank you rpg grandma uh i appreciate it um that yeah it was a fun uh fun reworking of it i i have dreams of turning that into a miniatures game someday because i very think i very much think in a miniatures scope a lot of times but um i also had a cool idea about uh turning it into so I've talked about them a lot of times. There are miniatures games now that are very art house games where you pretty much make your own miniatures, so to speak. You kind of kit bash things from whatever Barrett Wood, Turnip 28, um, you know, the Inquisition 28, uh, you know, kind of Warhammer spinoff, um, where you collect miniatures from wherever and you make your own faction or your own look for it. I always thought that my, my Jupiter idea would make a good basis for that, where you pretty much each player you know sort of builds out of a construction system their own faction you know their own the, this is the people of the moon of such and such and then you just go out and kit bash your, your your aliens you know you grab some fantasy some fantasy nulls you give them ray guns or laser swords and now we're the hyena men of whatever and then we play a skirmish game um that would be fun i think um uh, that's that's something I thought I might do. The Eye of Jupiter. Well, remember there was the old leather goddess of Phobos. Uh, oh yeah, uh, that, that that's the reason why I thought of, <laughs> of that one is that the in that book I was talking about the gas giant that they were orbiting was called Cat's Eye because of the way it looked uh, when you saw it from the night side. Yeah, it, it, it was actually faintly glowing for some reason. Well, if you remember in the even in the Lovecraftian mythos, there is a whole ass planet out there that is a Lovecraftian entity. Um, I can't remember which one it is. Uh, I'm not sure if it's necessarily one of Lovecraft's own or if it's one of his contemporaries, but there is a planet out there. Uh, there was a really cool article in the pages of Challenge magazine. Um, if you've never picked up a copy of Challenge, it's definitely worth it because Challenge is from that day and age where a company who had its own games would then write articles or allow articles for other games in its pages, you know, kind of like early dragon, you know, early to mid, mid, mid range dragon magazines did where TSR would have stuff from other companies, games in their magazines, uh, early white dwarfs, but challenge magazine had a wonderful article on mashing up call of Cthulhu. And then, at, and then at the then popular space, 1889 game where, and I've, I've kept this idea and used it a lot in, in various games that I've run, where in that setting, 
the Martian canals that are on Mars, the way that they, the reason that they're there is the Martians actually carving a massive elder, elder sign into their planet to protect it and protect the solar system from the old ones. It was basically the entire planet of Mars was an elder sign. And now that the Martian society has cr- has kind of gone into decline and the canals are crumbling, that elder sign that protects our, you know, our solar system from the, the old ones is deteriorating. And that's how, and so you now have this Burroughs-esque, you know, uh, space 89, space 1889 Mars is, you know, part Burroughs, uh, part hg wells and then you can combine that with your lovecraftian you know stuff and it just becomes a really great universe and like it works really cool because the 1889 martians had like their own little secret cults which is if there are some uh really cool stories told by oh i'm trying to remember his name i'm so bad with authors names contiguous to lovecraft in his his, in his in his writing circles uh, there was some good science fiction being re- written, and there was a whole series on um, of that takes place on Mars. But it is Mars. Edgar Rice Burroughs. No, it's wait, not, no. no it, it's not Burroughs. It's not Burroughs. I, yeah, I wanna... yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, like, wait, wait. I, no, think it's, I, it's I, like I read Clark the Martian Ashton, Chronicles. Clark Ashton the... Smith or one of those guys. Those guys who were contemporary yeah. to Lovecraft. I mean, and Burroughs in his writing, was kind circle. of a contemporary. It's just that. Um, Burroughs Hear me is... out, though. Let, let me finish. Not contemporary as in time, but like, well, in his time, but also in his writing circle. The author I'm thinking about was in Lovecraft's writing circle, which was, I, I can never remember all them all, but this was a Mars that was written as an eldritch setting. Basically, humans had come to Mars, the Martians were into some weird, dark, elder god shenanigans, and it often went bad for the humans in the story. This was a really good setting. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, Burroughs was definitely contemporary to Lovecraft as far as the writing. But um, yeah, Lovecraft's specific circle was pr- was a pretty tight number of names. Well, well um, what I was going to say about Burroughs' work is that it, it could be considered to be Gonzo, but it's not Elder Tar. No, no, it's, it's not. It's not Eldritch at all. It's Gonzo. I mean, Burroughs is, is Gonzo for sure. Uh, you have giant four-armed green guys and red-skinned humanoids and flying ships. And uh, and then he turns around and does it all again with Venus. Because, <laughs> you know, you know why, why, why come up with an original story for Venus? Um, but, um, yeah, you know, I guess if it worked the first time. <laughs> well, and, you know... What what what's funny is when I was reading the because I actually I actually started reading his Venus stuff before or before I got a chance to read his Mars stuff even though I knew about his Mars stuff, then I went back and read his Mars stuff. I'm like, why didn't he just write the Venus stories in Mars? I mean, mm-hmm. the protagonist is different, so of course the stories go differently. But I really feel like any, many of the stories that he puts on Venus could easily have been put into Mars. But well, I guess I guess if you're dealing with I want to create a whole bunch of new like resident alien species and stuff in a different biome then Venus works better, I guess. Yeah. So. Cause uh, the Martian Chronicles I read, uh, weren't like the main story. They were like side stories of like different characters in the same world, looking at things from a different perspective. And, the, and that was one thing I noticed with it is, is that it started to feel kind of samey is that he was having different people doing different things, but they're all looking at the same picture. <laughs> yep, this is the fun stuff we're talking about. Here we go. <laughs> Intelligent crabs that breed headless humans for them to use as bodies like hermit crabs use shells. There's some gonzo shit right there. <laughs> or, I mean, you could have, you could have a, uh, imagine having a race where you had, a, you know, in a fantasy setting where, yes, you have goblins and yes, you have ogres. But every goblin has an ogre, and they cruise around master blastering their way through life. That would be kind of gonzo. Uh, I have actually seen uh, fictional settings people wrote uh, where part of the reason why humans hated uh, certain other races is that these races would basically treat humans as farm animals. And not only got away with it but did so on a relatively large scale yeah there's some of that in lovecraft's work too um 
you know, the, um, if you ever read the rats in the walls, um, what the guy discovers below his, his family house is evidence of a society that bred, uh, selectively bred humans into cattle, um, and, you know, use them as beasts of burden. Uh, also in the book, the mound, which was ghost written by Lovecraft, um, uh, the society that's, that's, uh, that's written about in there has similar connections. In fact, I've always kind of felt that maybe they were possibly the same civilization, but of course nothing is ever clear, clearly defined in any of that, you know, in Lovecraftian work. So uh, it's kind of hard to say. Let's see. That is actually one of those things that you'll notice as a recurring theme in a lot of Gonzo uh, fiction is that they explain the parts of the plot that they feel are relevant. The rest of it, yeah, they might actually care about uh, uh, whether it makes sense. <laughs> well, I say the one thing to re resemble to resemble to remember with Gonzo is when you're running it, never feel. And this is actually true of like Lovecraftian stuff. Like if you're running Call of Cthulhu, never feel like you have to explain a world building element you do not have to have a rationale for it you don't want to be crazy about it but don't feel like you have to stop and have a reasonable explanation if you want to have a bunch of kobolds that water that, that you know ride around on ogre bodies um and that's their life until it actually becomes important don't bother with it don't worry about it you know why are some of the humans in your world red skinned and some of them are green skinned and some of them are human skinned does it matter? No, until it matters. And then, you know, but if this is like, honestly, if we dial that back, that's just world building 101. Yeah. Throw out elements of your world, use them as seeds. Sometimes they grow into something interesting. Sometimes they just kind of molder and die in the ground, but they're there. So well, you have, a, if you, if you, if you throw out a tower that's on the horizon as your party is adventuring, the tower is just scenery until the party decides to go adventure there or until later on you decide that that tower that you put out there, you need a location for an adventure. It, you have an idea for an adventure that takes place in a tower. Well, you've already placed a tower in your world. So now like in going back to the Gonzo thing, um, when you need something that tells a story between the problems between the fleshy human, the flesh colored humans and the red humans and the green humans, you've got them there. Um, yeah, you know, sometimes it's just about coming up with cool names. You know, I've I've got a setting. It's a weird fantasy uh, setting uh, where I've got the the people of iron. I've got the people of iron, the people of brass, and the people of gold, and they're all three members of the same race, and they live in three different cities. The people of iron are the industrialists, manufacturers. The people of brass are the merchant class and the, the the movers and the shakers. And the people of gold are the ones who control it all and benefit from the work of both of both the other two cities. But honestly, originally it was just three names because it sounded cool. And I could have easily thrown that in a, in, in a game and said, and the, we have the three cities, the city of the city of iron, the city of brass, the city of gold. And the people are like, Oh, those are cool. What are those? And then you're like, okay, well, you'll have to go there someday. <laughs> well, uh, one analogy that I've heard for, for uh, world building is that perhaps the easiest way is the like a pile of bricks analogy uh, to explain it is um, each time you write something into the setting, it's like adding a brick to a wall. And then when you write more you're you're stacking bricks on top of each other you're like oh here's a city and then and then later on you like okay here's who lives in that city and so on and so forth yeah uh, rpg grandma it's funny you, you mentioned this i have um i have a culture i built i will build random cultures even if they're not going to go into a game just because i have an idea and i had this idea about a, set, a society where necromancy wasn't seen as weird um, and in that society, the dead were honored and maintained because there was an idea in that society that your, your duty to your family and your city and your, and your, and your people didn't end at death. 
And so, um, like soldiers would be buried with perfectly functional weapons. Um, and like in times of crisis, war, famine, devastation, the dead would be, would be called to duty. They wouldn't be summoned forcibly. They died going and they went to the grave with a sense of obligation to their living relatives who revered them in their homes and the state revered them and all of that uh, to the point where you were considered shameful if you didn't keep your dead loved one's equipment up to date. Like if you buried a guy with a spear and a shield and then it went to rot in the ground and you didn't like periodically replace it with good weapons, you were considered a substandard citizen who wasn't doing your duty, A, to the society you lived in, but also to your departed, still relevant loved ones. Because when war wartime came and they needed to call up the dead to fight for them, your ancestor would have subpar equipment or when they needed extra builders to deal with, you know, the flooding that ruined, you know, the walls or undermined, you know, the, the bridges, you know, if you're Mason, if you're a from a family of Masons and your dead Mason, you know, ancestors don't have proper tools, you're, you're a craptastic citizen. So I, I like your idea with the, you know, the mummy that reminded me of the mummification, but, uh, yeah, you can never go wrong with in Gonzo with a people ruled by somebody other than themselves. Mm. Uh, in the setting that I have for that has the city of iron, gold, brass, and gold, there is also another culture because it's it's kind of t- attached to D and D sort of. Um, there is a group of Zvarts, and I know I know uh, Geek's going to chime in here because he, he loves Zvarts. There's a group of Zvarts that are ruled by a council, which is a a council of kings, which is actually a single gibbering mouther who is just insane because he's a gibbering mouther and talks to himself as if he was a council. But yeah, if you take a race A and have them ruled by a singular or small group of race B or even race A, B, and C, you know, you have some great fuel for Gonzo stuff right there. You know, she mentioned the, the lizard king, is always a good one because humans ruled by a reptile overlord. You know, it's just, it just sings. Let's see. Yeah. You know, it's necromancy. is so I always thought that like a good way to run a necromancer is I wanted to run basically a white necromancer once in the, in his spells were themed as entreatments upon the dead to assist, assist the living. He's not forcing people. In fact, I even went so far as to think about making specific spells. So like instead of like raise dead, which is usually like, you know, calling forth, you know, a whole bunch of people kind of just forcing them to be alive um, or summoning skeletons where you might get 1d6 skeletons hit this, this white necromancer might be able to summon one dead thing, but it might be better because you're asking somebody, Hey, I could use some help here. And so like one hero or, something from the past or a ghost or something shows up to help you out. Well, one of the um, f- works of high fantasy that I read long ago, uh, the main character was a good necromancer. And one of his signature abilities was actually just speak to dead because of the fact that he could get information from the dead that no living person knew. Well, yeah, and you know, the, 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 what's funny is in I know we're way off the topic of Gonzo here. Although you know, societies living with the dead can be pretty Gonzo. Um, <clears throat> uh, a lot of the healing spells are actually in D anD D once they started to categorize them in the necromancy department um, because you're controlling life energies. Um, yeah, that uh, Hyperborea treats necromancy and cleric as two sides of the same coin. Well, and, you know, the thing is, is that modern, so modern language tends to mark necromancy as magic dealing with the dead. But originally it was just a way to say evil magic guy. Hmm. Uh, it was, it was called necromancy because evil magic guys often fiddled with the dead, but well, it wasn't I mean, like specific. Necro is a, a root that means dead, but yes, that, that's... Well, but I, I guess originally that kills people. <laughs> no, originally it was just a way to to label somebody as a 
dark magician not specifically dealing with the dead. They did deal with the dead and therefore they got the name, but it was a more generalized term. Sort of like sorcerer is a generalized term in ancient you know in its in its roots. It didn't mean anything specific that was codified or anything like that. It was just a way of saying magic guy and usually had a darker connotation than say wizard. Yeah. Mm, <laughs> or yeah. You know, because wizard is kind of like wazir, which is like, you know, just a wise guy. Because like well, one of the things that that's noteworthy in Hyperborea is that um, there is a certain spell that is actually able to be cast both by clerics and by necromancers. Care to guess what that one is? No. Which one? It's a spell that uh, causes a recently deceased person to come back to life with a fraction of their normal hit points because the raised dead. <laughs> yeah. But the, the thing, the logic with this though, is that, you know, it's like, it's a necromancer doing it by taking a, a deceased body and actually making it not just animated, but living. Well, yeah. And, that's the difference between raised dead and animate dead. But um, with, with a cleric, it's literally just them healing a person from being dead. Is it? I mean, or, or I mean, because really, I mean, ultimately, I think they're both accomplishing the same things. It's just the the cleric would be asking the powers above to revive the person, whereas the necromancer is literally forcing the magical energies of the world to channel life energy into the body. They're accomplishing the same thing, but the the code for the program, so to speak, is different. Hmm. You know, because wizard because clerics ostensibly everything that they cast cast in games is really a, effectively a prayer to their gods above mm. uh, or they are imbued with divine power which works like magical energy whereas in most games alongside that you have arcane magic which is a different form of channeling energies they're different energies usually as well which is why you will j often see distinctions in rule systems between arcane magic effects and divine magic effects now old D, &D didn't tend to do that as much in the mechanics of the game but the origins that are written into the character classes is very specific um uh, i'm i would have to, to to look back at it to see what the um in, in universe justification for why necromancers can do what they can do is, but um, a lot of the magic users in Hyperborea are actually functionally um, getting their power from deities of some sort. Well, if you're if talking about Hyperborea, the 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 you know uh, the Conan world, or the you know, are you talking about the actual. Hyboria, or no, you're talking about Hyperborea, the the the, the role playing game, right? Yeah, the the, the one where it's its own universe. I mean, it, it yeah. functions by its own rules. So, yeah, I mean, exactly. but, but yeah, I I can't speak to that. But then again, every game world works to its own own rules. There are some repeats because a lot of them often repeat the D and D style of magic, or even if they don't use like a fancy and magic spell system they ha still have that very distinct divine versus arcane magic thing um i just noticed the time we got three minutes till i gotta call it done because i got a game to get to myself um so mar hawkman thanks for coming on here i uh, appreciate the chat uh i'm gonna go ahead and drop you off here and then i'm gonna go ahead and do a couple closing statements and i'll see everybody next week yeah see you later all right later man all right so folks Thank you for coming in and uh, good comments uh, really fueled the last half of the, uh, the, the, uh, the episode here. Uh, so appreciate that. Uh, RPG grandma. Thank you for all the wonderful uh, information that you provided uh, great perspective on that. Thanks to everybody who came in. Uh, you old geek. If you do not watch his channel or are subscribed to his channel, go ahead and do so. I appear there on Wednesdays, most Wednesdays, uh, where we do Midweek Geek. Uh, he does lots of cool stuff like video game live plays of old uh, vintage games um, yeah, like Dungeon Keeper and D&D. He reads through some of the old fighting fantasy books and other solo adventure books. Uh, he does RPG reviews and has been flip doing some flip throughs through White Dwarf and Dragon, 
which are worth it. He has some commentary videos as well. And some like, you know, um, what do they call those? The, uh, the uh, tiered uh, videos where, you know, does the ratings. Uh, so definitely a channel worth going to. RPG Grandma has a channel also. Good, good old school gaming wisdom there. Um, and let's see, we had GM Cody on here. He has a good channel full of all sorts of multi-system input and feedback. Um, Mage's Musings, he is the D&D guy uh, to go to. I mean, he talks about, you know, OSE, which is ostensibly BX, uh, and AD&D. He is, does a great entertaining channel where he has a puppet, uh, a couple of puppets for hosts, and some great, he's, he's settled on a, a way of doing campaign diaries that is probably the most interesting I've seen uh, of any channel uh, and he has kind of he does the review cap uh, and his review caps are both telling you about the dungeon or the module that he's running but also about what's going on in his games uh, it's very entertaining the only other person I can think of that comes comes close and is probably on the same caliber but in a different style is Seth Krakowski he wasn't here but if you've ever seen any of his videos you know what I'm talking about very entertaining uh, let's see. Mar Hawkman was here. Uh, Mar Hawkman does have a channel where he posts some interesting stuff. Uh, lots of uh, cool, like insights and stuff on episodes of Star Trek and things that just that he comes up with. Um, Logan slash Chris slash GI Joe Gamer uh, from the Hilt is his channel. Uh, lots of cool stuff. He's got his own game system that he's created, and he talks about GI Joe stuff and comics and other things in general. All right. Well, that was the longest winded outro ever. Um, thanks a lot for getting me to 200 subscribers. Uh, I will see everybody next Sunday. And if you're not over on the Elf Bait Discord, go over and join. I post things there all the time. I posted some stuff today and people are certainly welcome to post and chat there as well. Um, I will be doing those Monday games and I'll be talking about the Monday games on my Discord. Have a good one, everybody, and uh, get out and game.